Welcome back to another episode of Plastic Weekly. And this week, I am honored to be joined by somebody who, uh, who, if you're, you know, really psyched about climbing and you Google everything you see on your first couple trips to the gym, you're probably going to stumble across this guy's name. It is Jason Keel, uh, a prolific climber, competitor, root setter, hold shaper, wall designer, uh, and maybe first ascensionist is something that you would consider closest to your heart. But I wanted to ask mm-hmm. you if, if you had to kind of sum up uh, uh, an introduction of yourself and your career in a, in a short blurb, how would you try and describe yourself to people? Uh, well, it's complicated because uh, I'm doing so much as far as, you know, design and, and uh, climbing, but uh, I guess I'm trying to, you know, take art and climbing and, and put that, together in many ways as possible with, you know, videos, first ascents, um, gym design, climbing holds, basically anything that I can do involving climbing, uh, just put my own twist on it and, you know, give that back to everyone. Are you, uh, are you an art school kid in the same way that, you know, some, some other hold shapers and climbers have, have gone through that, uh, stream? Did you do the same thing? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I was always in art school like when I was really young, but then I did some college courses, basically took all the art classes that I could take in college. And then when I had to start taking the real classes, I, I bailed. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I did all the painting, photography, sculpture, all that stuff. Um, and then kind of just took it from there. Um, and I, I got, you know, interested in climbing whole design, like really like soon after I started climbing. Did sculpture and like three dimensional art uh, strike you as kind of a, a primary passion in art school, the way that it's kind of taken over your life now with shaping and wall design? Yeah, definitely. I think that was the thing that you know always stood out is you know creating something with your hands, uh, especially something that's usable like a wall or a climbing hold. Um, the stuff I was making in art school was more like you know, usable sculptures, like things you wore or things you rode or stuff like that. So it's definitely like the next step to, you know, involve climbing with it. All right. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple kind of, I don't want to say throwaway questions, but these might normally be uh-huh. like a, a um, like a lightning round kind of thing. So just really quickly to sure. break into the whole conversation was, is, is there a hold of yours that you would uh, be most proud of? Kind of the, the one you'd like to use as your tombstone uh, when you die? Um, no, not, not really one hold. I mean, I guess some stuff I've done, uh, with the, the roids, which are this bubbly series, like were really complicated and, and took a really long time. Uh, but most recently, uh, most proud of, I think is the levels that I did and their symmetrical, uh, series of holds that there's a left and right of every single hold and they're all different facets. So it was like super complicated uh, to design the whole set. And it was like a huge undertaking. And it was kind of like, you know, makes your mind hurt just thinking about it, you know? Um, that's, I'm gonna break off of my, my stream just to talk about that kind of thing is, uh, we, I kind of, I kind of see the levels as a project similar to the way that Egrips talked about Typhus's uh, weave series, in that it kind of is like a, not a culmination of your of your life's work in in root setting, but almost in. It, it kind of a thesis was used, I think, by by Ty to describe it, and that yeah. it has so much work. And I'm curious if you guys feel like it's not as much an accomplishment of how good the holds are as a product, but more of just like this is your, you know, uh, I'm I'm losing the word for it, but your personal mission in life just becomes completing yeah, something I mean, this difficult. It's almost like a very large test, right? <laughs> like, how can we do this? Um, we had the concept to do a symmetrical series of holds for a really long time. And, you know, some companies had some, you know, smaller versions of that, nothing like to this extent. And we just kept brainstorming, brainstorming, come up with, you know, a concept that we could do in this style. And uh, yeah, it was like this huge test to, you know, can we complete this? And like, you know, once it's done, it did it, did it work out how I wanted it to work out? Like, you know, does it climb well and all that. Well, it, well, can you evaluate yourself on on those holds? Like, did they turn out the way you kind of expected in terms of um, when you set with them, or or just how they uh, how they look when you're taking photos or whatever? 
Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, how they climb, you know, they're pretty basic. They're, you know, they have 90 degree flat uh, faces that meet up. So, um, kind of basic in, in, in that regard, but you know, the rest of the shape really, you know, determines a lot. Um, and I think when anyone looks at the work they've done, they see all the flaws. So maybe when you look at it, you're like, oh, that looks amazing. That looks perfect. And, and when I look at it, I'm like, that looks like junk. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, this, this face is off five degrees. This is off, you know. So I definitely see all the imperfections. And I don't think that, you know, the average gym climber or, you know, someone who's inspecting the holds are going to notice. But I'm, like, kind of critical of my work. So it's, like, hard not to see. You, you mentioned that uh, when you were talking about developing those, uh, that you were kind of talking about the concept with a group of people. What's the team like when you're, um, well, I guess I should say that some people think of hold shaping and, and it often is an individual endeavor. You get the block of foam and you create what you want to create. And sometimes it'll get molded and sometimes it won't. Um, but what is the creative team like uh, when you work with the guys at So Ill for a new line of holds? Um, well, yeah, usually like I do a lot of experimenting myself. Um, I come up with a bunch of different ideas and yeah, like you're saying, not everything gets made at all. I have a bunch of stuff sitting on the shelf that never really came to, but, uh, basically I mostly talk with Dan Chancellor, the owner of So Ill, Um, and we kind of shoot things back and forth and, you know, I'll show him what I'm working on and he'll be like, Oh, this is great, but let's, you know, how about this? We twist it this way. Um, we've also used Chris Danielson as reference, you know, like asking him what he prefers or what people are buying. Um, just other setters too, like kind of like, you know, wanting to get people's opinion, Warren Byram, John Unks, like guys like that who work with Soil and, you know, they're setting all the time. So, um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting process, you know, it's like, not everything is gold, you know, right out of the, the gate. I remember talking to, uh, in this rare moment when I was super young and I was just like stunned to be able to have a conversation with Danielson because I was just like young and impressionable. He, he mentioned this story where he was working with a hold manufacturer and basically told them like, hey, I want holds like this. And then the hold company mm -hmm. basically did that and they became really well, uh, like well marketed, well designed and then really profitable holds. And I was surprised that holds weren't really just about the shapers creating what they wanted to see or what they wanted to to shape um and that there was so much feedback from from other people in the community um how do you like how do you narrow down the voices that you're listening to like you talked about john and ward i know ward mm -hmm. works for earth treks who you're associated with i, I don't know if yeah. john is still at uh so will uh, climb so well or not. I think he was in the past, he's, but he's not, but he, he still works with so ill, the company, not the gym. Right. So, so what makes like a, a, a voice valuable for feedback? Because it is a really creative endeavor and root setting is full of some, great yeah. and some really bad ideas. For sure. And it's the same with wall design, you know, you get too many people or too many ideas and then you're just deconstructing everything and kind of going backwards. Um, so I think it's, you know, better to work in smaller groups, mostly just me and Dan in the beginning. And then once we kind of get it fleshed out and we know we're on the right, in the right direction, then you take it to other people like that. Um, and usually the feedback's pretty good. I mean, and definitely from someone like Danielson, like where he sees what people are buying. And I mean, that's not super important to me. Sure, sure it's important, but like, I want to make a cool, interesting hold and like the sellability of it is not, not salesman at all. Like I just want to create something cool and if people buy it, they buy it. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, all that stuff goes into it. Um, is there a, a hold or a series of holds that were shaped by someone else in the world where you wish you had been the one to shape that? Um, not necessarily, but, you know, you always see stuff that's, like, so close to other ideas. And, you know, especially now, there's so many hold companies that everything's kind of just merging together. Um, so, I don't know. I try to just keep an open eye and, you know, try and do something that's not being done. Um, so, it's kind of hard, you know, coming up with a, a 
style that no one's seen before. Um, and just being fresh and not feeling like you're, you know, ripping someone off or like biting off of that style too much. Um, but yeah, there's just so many holds out now. It's like ridiculous. Speaking of so many holds, a question I wanted to ask was about whether you feel like kind of the laws or the patterns of fashion are, are playing a role in hold shaping and, and hold manufacturing. I know for myself, the first time I noticed it was when stalactites kind of became a thing in hold shaping and you saw it in like the, the Tegan Kaijus and then you saw a lot of derivatives coming from Europe and, and Asia and more mm -hmm. being made in North America. And now, and this ties into the levels that you designed is kind of the, the concave scoop shape, which you're seeing mm -hmm. iterated on like in every size and and pinches and slopers yeah. and everything it's it's blown up where that wasn't really something that you know 15 years ago was was really common um so do you find that you're ever forced to to try and create a product that that fits a niche that's currently like really popular or do you are you pretty much um, able to to stay on maybe the cutting edge or just create your own path try, trying to stay on the cutting edge you know and, and trying to like you know absorb all that but at the same time uh keep keep it new keep it fresh um yeah it's like you're saying about the kaijus you know there's like so many different versions of that if you were to put all of these styles next to each other it would just kind of be like a blend of everything you know it'd be hard to tell like where one started and one finished um but yeah as much as i can you know like trying to keep it fresh um I haven't done anything new since the levels. We're, we're doing a lot of line expansion right now. Like we just expanded the fungus and um, the fungus and the chunks. And then I'm in molding right now are the innies. And I just did a whole nother spread of innies that are more juggy. So more positive innies pockets. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't know, next time I do something new, like I definitely want it to be different than everything you're seeing. Um, I feel like dual texture is super hot right now. Um, it seems like everyone's like dual texture, dual texture. And I'm like kind of wanting to go the opposite. You, haven't, you haven't touched um, dual texture in a while. It's, I feel like most of your stuff for the last five years has had nothing to yeah, do with dual texture. Well, we had some issues with production and dual texture um, at Aragon. And basically they told us that no matter how shiny you make it, that over time it's going to lose its shine. And we kind of just were like, okay, well then why are, why are we bothering? You know, like sure. The first couple of pieces come out like super nice and shiny, but then you see some product in the gym, like a year or two down the road and it's like a matte finish. And like, I don't know, it's just, I don't know. And I, I stand on dual text a lot, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of not as really effective as people think it is, you know, unless it's like a really nice paper. A, a while ago, I used to be psyched on dual text from the perspective that like in 2013, all of us were talking about or actually making the switch to like monochromatic root setting. And mm -hmm. in the gym I was in, we mostly had like smaller holds at the time, like everybody else. And so you often ran into a thing where like, Hey, if you squeeze this pinch and you, this pinch is on a boulder for six weeks, it's going to go from Brown to white. And when you put a Brown pinch beside mm -hmm. a purple, jug, oh, yeah, they sure. all look white at the end. So at the time for I was sure. like, yeah, dual texture is going to save us because it lets you see the color through, you know, two months of chalk. But mm -hmm. as everything got bigger, that stopped really being a problem. Um, what, what is the yeah. value of dual text right now? Is, is that just a fashion thing as well? Cause it looks like super sick but you're right. You can usually stand on it. I mean, it is to some extent. Yeah. It's, to some extent it is. People want it because it's nice and shiny and like, um, definitely a trend. Uh, that is, that is an awesome, you know, point, you know, being able to see it, you know, when it gets chalky. And I think there was a couple of companies, some European companies that were even doing like a ring around that was dual text for like jibs and stuff to keep the color. Uh, I think that's awesome. Um, and I think, you know, people kind of get trapped in the idea that dual text is this one style, which dual texture just means a different texture. Um, so dual text could be anything, you know. Um, so I like seeing that, you know, I think, was it Element or someone? They had like this carbon fiber dual texture looking stuff. I don't know if you saw them at a PWA, like 
a year or so ago. Yeah. But, you know, people that are doing stuff like that, like, that's awesome. Um, not just using dual texture for the sake of using it, but trying to come up with a different type of dual, dual texture. Um, speaking of kind of like busting or like kind of creating your own path, I wanted to ask a little bit about the... Um, uh, the the fungus series that you did because it I, I'm I'm really conflicted about these holes personally I find they it's really hard for me to force movement when I set with the fungus holds because there are so many <laughs> options with all the little pockets and you get like a million different pinches for a lot of the holds it, it makes it kind of tough <laughs> to create movement but it's like without being a baby head they are the most striking holds like there's yeah. been no holds in history that have had that kind of footprint like the chalk shadow they leave sure. is unimaginable sure. and they like i i'm in love with these holds because of the identity that they have um mm -hmm. how how have you like the I, they've been out for i don't know what like maybe five ish years at this point how how do you feel about that particular uh set of holds that you design now that you're expanding on them um yeah well that was kind of one of the reasons that we did expand because a lot of the original line which Really, there's not that many, and um, you know they weren't very directional. Um, and a lot of the, the new stuff I did is more directional, more sloper, more like jugs. Um, but yeah, they're definitely like a, a big gym style of hold. Like when you see them at like the Earth Treks or something, it's like a line. You know, like you see the line, and the climbers are drawn to it, and uh probably not the best for home wall i have i have all of them on my home wall um and they definitely have a bigger footprint um and i think that was one of the initial ideas was you know to do bigger holds but you know have kind of this hollow front technique where you're you know getting rid of material by removing the front and having holes pass through it um so I think they, they do well for, you know, what, what they're supposed to do as far as being striking. And hopefully this new line that I did is going to, you know, really fill out, fill it out and make more sense. How do you find the hold shaping industry has changed in the last 10 years? I know you've been in it for longer than that, but it feels like yeah. things have accelerated maybe. Um, what, what feels yeah. different from somebody on the inside? Um, it's overwhelming that I see like, three new hold companies every week. Um, you know, back in the day, you know, we are like, oh, you know, we want to get the pusher holds, we want to get Stone Age, we want to get Voodoo, you know, like nowadays, you, even if you're a massive gym, you can't get like even, I don't know, 15% of, you know, the market. Like you cannot have it in your facility. Like there's just any hold out there. So it's kind of it's kind of overwhelming, you know. It's like uh, it's like this sea of holds, and you know, there's no consistency to it. Like you always would go somewhere and you'd see the boss, you know, in a gym, and you'd go to another gym and be like, oh yeah, there's, there's the boss, you know. <laughs> like it's like a staple of the climbing gym. So it's definitely interesting, you know. You see these random gyms like in Czechoslovakia or wherever, and every hold is a hold that you've never seen by a company you've never heard of. And they're just as big and they look just as fun. And, you know, these big blobs on the wall, it's like, yeah, it's, it's crazy. From your perspective, like 10 years ago, I knew it was really easy to tell the difference between like, um, I'll just say like good holds or an established, like a good product versus mm -hmm. like a new climb comes up or sorry, not a new climb, a new uh, hold manufacturer comes up and you can tell right away just by the pictures on the website, you're like, oh, this plastic doesn't look uh, great. These pores are kind mm -hmm. of wacky. The sanding is not like tier one sanding. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm having more trouble discerning between like the, the good and the bad right now. And that might just be because yeah. a lot of new manufacturers have really good manufacturing. Like, why is that? Is it just the economies of scale is making all these like pouring houses more effective? Like, why is it that some random kid from wherever can now be pouring really awesome, high quality? Yeah. Shapes? Yeah. Pour, pouring good shapes, like get into a good pouring house or even like, I mean, it's, it's so important, not just the hold, but like the quality of the photo um you know the quality of how it's represented on the site and that's just so much more accessible nowadays um i mean we're trying to do the, the 3d views for all of our holds in so ill and it just like looks 
so much nicer and so much more professional um, than, you know, a random photo you take and you try and do a bad Photoshop job and cut it out, you know. Um, and I think people have just better access to technology now. And, yeah, even with the holds, uh, um, the more knowledge, you know, like 10 or so years ago, there was, you know, maybe five YouTube videos about how to make a climbing hold. Um, and now it's like there's way, way more and, you know, all that stuff's just blowing up. It's just more information, more technology everywhere. Um, a problem that we used to run into was, uh, like random companies basically stealing shapes and remolding them and selling them in different yeah. parts of the world. And I don't see those posts on like the Facebook groups as much as we used to, but we see discussions a couple times a year of like, oh, this well-respected hold shaper and this kind of up and coming guy has now shaped something kind of similar. And a topic yeah. that, you know, every, maybe once a year, the conversation is mm -hmm. had about intellectual property, but we never go anywhere with it. Whether Like recently there was no, about no. a logo and, and but <laughs> yeah. like what's, is, is there, a relevant discussion to be had or is this just something we're going to have to deal with where, Hey, bubble wrap is super cool. I'm going to make something really super close yeah. to that. I mean, it's tough. I've definitely seen those conversations and usually it's like, Oh yeah. Hey, sorry. I wasn't, you know, taking your idea. I had the exact same idea myself and then it just kind of fizzles out. Um, but yeah, it's like, I don't know, kind of respecting, you know, other people's work, you know, and, like a couple years back, some I think it was an Iranian company just molded the iron palm, uh, <laughs> my handboard, and I like posted. I was like, uh, "Have you guys seen this?" Like, and they were like, "Oh, there's no copyright laws here in Iran." And I was just like, "Well, like you just can't do this, you know." Um, so there's some instances where people have been called out and they've stopped production, um, but then there's others where yeah, people just are like kind of just phase it out and nothing really happens. So I don't know. I just respect other people's work and, you know, hopefully people will do the same to you. Are there any hold lines? You Well, I'm not going to ask you uh, specifics, but have you run into a situation where there's like a hold line or a series out there where you're like, man, I could, I could take this and run with it. Like there's stuff that hasn't been done with this style or whatever. Do you find yourself tempted to maybe uh, take an idea and build on it when somebody's maybe abandoned it? Um, yeah, but not necessarily, especially if it's like still in production. Um, you definitely see things sometimes and you get an idea from that, you know, like you see something and you're like, oh, oh, that's cool, but maybe, you know, cooler. Um, so I've definitely had that experience. I've had people like message me, they're like, oh, I, you know, I did the same style of, of hold and I didn't realize it. And I'm like, well, it's not exactly the same, you know, it's not like they're purposely ripping off the bubble wrap, which is a great example, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's kind of unmistakable. Like if you're doing bubble wrap, it's not like it's your, it's your thing, but um, yeah, it's tough. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Just try to respect people, respect their work. And, you know, I don't know. I try to do something new. So copying someone else's work or expanding on someone else's line is kind of not really the direction I'm looking. All right. I want to uh, kind of wrap up on the, the holds talk by talking about uh, texture. Um, most of the lines that you've shaped in the last like half decade or maybe longer, um, the it's it's all about kind of the the like the structural shape of the hold, whether it's like the chunks or the the bubbies. For the most part, is it's basically a smooth mm -hmm. texture. You could maybe even argue that that your uh, um, uh, the roids were were also kind of like this, although the texture is is starting to get a bit smaller and you actually feel something in your fingers. Um, but you know, we, used, there used to be a lot of holds out there where the, and there still are where the texture is, is, um, trying to either emulate or a rock or, or so that you feel, you know, undulations or patterns within the pads of your fingers, rather than just grabbing these smooth shapes mm -hmm. of, of, of different sizes. Um, do you, do you think that that's something that might come back, whether it's real rock or, or manufactured textures where we start trying to, um, uh, create these textures on surfaces rather than just these smooth shapes that have certainly taken over the industry? 
Um, are you talking about like the actual texture of the foam of the hold? Sorry, sorry or that's, yeah, that's a really good texture point. Texture that created. Yeah, the, uh, so a texture that the shaper would create, not just the 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 inherent foam texture, but you know. Um, uh, I'm trying to think the of material. Uh, okay. yes, yeah. trying to think of a so ill shape. There aren't actually that many that have it, but there was there was like the scars or something, right? Where it had the the surface had kind of a pattern and texture to it. Whereas okay. you look at the Jagged chunks texture. where it's, it's yeah. yeah, where it's just a shape and there's there's nothing else going on. Mm -hmm. Um, I I like that. Like, well, I like smooth stuff, and a lot of my stuff is smooth. Um, just because I think it's more fun to climb on. And I think the more people are trying to do real rock type of stuff, um, I don't know. I don't like it. I think over time it gets even more aggressive. Um, I, and I'm never trying to recreate the rock. I'm just trying to take the concept of the rock, like the fungus could be, you know, a cartoon version of the Red River Gorge or a cartoon version of Waco Tanks. Um, and I guess the roids, which you mentioned, are a really good example because <clears throat> when I climb on them, although they're this bubbly, you know, you know, rounded kind of bubbly, fun texture, it reminds me very much of climbing outside. Uh, and I really like that. You know, you hit a hold and your, hold, your hand's not going to be flat on it. You have to, like, stack your fingers in a certain way. And, like, that really feels like outside for me, um, even though it is smooth. Um, I, I like that more than I like actually trying to recreate like texture, like be it granite, um, or, or stuff like that, you know, like the, the position of the shape and the grip is like still plastic and still fun, like indoors, but it has that feel like when you grab it, it's hard because it doesn't fit your hand perfectly. You have to figure out what's going on. Yeah, it's that's the kind of the the point that I I I was getting to is that that's something I miss in indoor climbing is is I I guess I kind of understand maybe there's a, a competitive point to not trying to to make the beta so microscopic and so about like mm -hmm. you know, exact finger placement so that you give everybody a fair <laughs> shot yeah One but I yeah, yeah like just like find the nub kind of thing but indoor climbing which is all I do I I really miss having that kind of dimension to the climbs it's mm -hmm. now it is very much like okay i'm gonna go from this squadra pinch to this flat hold scoop yeah and i don't think at all about my fingers anymore right like that's it's sure. it's just not a thing and for yourself somebody that your your bread and butter is getting outside um i i guess i'm kind of surprised to see shapers like yourself have embraced this this kind of like minimalist style of of surfaces um when when most of your experience is is the opposite yeah I mean, I think it's just not as fun when you try and recreate it to that level inside. Um, it just ends up being weird and painful. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, this awkwardness of, you know, you're saying you just grab pinches and go like, like when I'm outside, like, I'm like, oh, I can't figure this out. It's not because I'm, I can't pull on the pinch. It's because, oh, I didn't find the thumb catch, you know, right away. And I think holds like the roids, also having setters, you know, set things like that. Um, a lot of times when I, I have a spray wall and a lot of times when I put the holds on, like I like the holds that don't fit you perfectly. Mm -hmm. You know, I like it that, okay, it's more sideways or it's more Gaston, but when you hit it, it's not the way you want it to, to be. And I think when you're outside, that's what makes things difficult. You know, um, if everything was perfect, it would just be like, you know, standard power problem that you know drill pockets or, or whatever um so yeah i like that like and it's there's a fine line between making it uncomfortable and weird and making it you know relatable to indoor climbing yeah i guess what i'm saying is i just miss it because like it does kind of i don't know if you agree but it, it seems to limit the shelf life of a climb when like oh i get on this mm -hmm. thing like i mentioned with like let's just say like a bunch of flat hold pinches I'm not missing the beta probably, right? Like I've, I probably know what no. I'm supposed to be doing with my body and you're just like, oh, I can either do it or I can't. There isn't that extra yeah. like, well, you know, maybe if I find exactly the right thing, exactly the right way to grip mm -hmm. it, it's just not there anymore. And and uh, I, I like I, I'm in a gym that is probably 
relatively like comp influenced rather than outdoor influenced just in the middle of a big city but um i guess this is just mm-hmm. my, my plea to people like you like please make more yeah more, uh, more uh yeah. roid style stuff because i i love that um yeah. i hope it'll come back i hope there's like a pendulum swing and we start to see more of that again um because i yeah I'm noticing i, I, I miss it. So. Yeah. small feet too i miss small feet yeah you know <laughs> Back in the day, it was, uh, you know, you're on these greasy jibs and the greasier, the better. And like, it, that is really like outside granite climbing, you know, Yosemite granite or whatever. It's like you have these tiny, tiny feet. The hands are, are good. You look at the problem, you're like, oh, I'm going to do that easy. And then you look at the feet and you're like, oh, God, like, you know, that's why it's hard. And I think that's also has been lost lately uh, with these gigantic footholds. <laughs> You're you're a root setter and you know a ton of really influential root setters. So like if you if you guys all love tiny feet, why why aren't gyms using tiny feet? What's the problem? Uh, I don't know. I guess it's not uh, it's not like it doesn't make the people happy. I guess you know everyone's like, I mean yeah, it's like everything you can do in your tennis shoes nowadays. It's like a totally different world, and I, I guess I that's why I like finding that on my home wall. You know, it's like more my own thing than you know kind of this commercial market just you know to make people happy um and then lastly with holds is is there a hold you've shaped that you like at this point after this career of hold shaping you're kind of like that's that's not my like what's your kind of least favorite hold that you've shaped over time where you feel like you know that one of all the experiments i've done it was probably the biggest failure um well there's a bunch of stuff that uh i did for so ill like in the beginning and it wasn't like my you know idea but like they were kind of really trying to push this idea of different holds you know like all this weird stuff and so it kept getting weirder and weirder like organs hands like all this stuff and tongues you know and none of it was something that i would you know want to really shape but at the time it was like you know they're trying to like prove a point and just do as much weird stuff as possible and uh so i guess stuff like that you know um I guess, uh, well, the baby heads are, are you know, kind of strange and stand out. Uh, I, I don't think they're making them anymore, but the actual, you know, the smaller ones that are actual baby heads that we molded, um, I guess some people had some issues with them when they were sent out and stuff. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was kind of joking with some friends about like what we thought you might say to that, that answer. One of them, one of them uh, thought it might be the growth that you shaped for like, I guess, so well in Rockworks. What, what's your relationship with a project that massive for something that kind of never ended up having that much longevity? Um, well, the growth. And then I, I did another one after that, that was the spore and it was kind of like these bulbous things. All of those were kind of like, I don't know that to me, they were kind of ruined because I was more into the shape and they were so concerned that the hold was so big and that no one was going to use it that they kept being like, let's put peanuts, let's put peanuts, let's put peanuts. And I'm like, you don't like, you don't want peanuts. And so those were kind of like, they had good intentions, but you know, you know, just, you know, you have this weird blob and then you have a bunch of like mini jugs on it. It doesn't make any sense, you know? (laughs) Um, so go one way or the other, you know, I would have preferred it if they were just, you know, shapes of, of their own. So, so those were envisioned as, as like basically standalone macros, were they not intended in your mind to be used as volumes? No, I would, I mean, I would prefer they weren't, um, especially the spore cause it was kind of, you know, set with slopers and, you know, directional slopers, um, I feel like that one would have been like way better without it. But I think they were just, you know, it was kind of early in that time and they were just concerned that without peanuts, people like wouldn't be psyched. Um, speaking of T-nuts, I swear we're going to stop talking about holds in a second. We're, this is yeah. going to be the transition to walls, I promise. How long until uh, we see a gym or how long until it's common for new gyms to be built without any T-nuts in the walls? Is that day coming one day? Uh, I don't know. I hope not. Like, I don't like it. I, I, yeah, I don't like it at all. Um, I actually tried it, um, cause people are talking about it. I know Louie Anderson's a big advocate of it. Um, but I hate it. Like I, I love peanuts. They're super fast, super easy. Um, there's nothing worse than putting like a six, you know, screw 
volume on and then realizing you have to turn it 10 degrees and all you'd have to do is loosen a bolt and turn it 10 degrees. So I'm like not into it at all. Um, I think it totally should be used within the setting. You know, you should never be afraid to screw something on. But in general, it's just so much quicker to just, you know, use a bolt and then be like, oh, I want to rotate it a little bit, you know. Um, I have a 15-degree wall and a 50-degree wall in my garage. And the 15-degree wall, I did all screw on at first, and I just, like, did not like it at all. Hmm. I, I ended up taking them all down eventually and putting peanuts in the wall. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, I'm like not for it at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, which is great. I hear a lot of people are psyched. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting discussion. Like I don't really set anymore. Um, so for me, it's it's just about like making the walls, I guess, a little bit cheaper to build. But also if, if you know, a gym opens and they're psyched about all this fiberglass stuff, it kind of becomes like, okay, how much of your hold budget is – dedicated to screw on volumes which is like becoming a bigger and bigger share of your hold buy at what point do you just mm -hmm. say you know what this is who we are now we're not going to worry about buying all the all the mini jugs and stuff but um yeah that's a, a really good point that's fair i'm sure there's a lot of root setters yeah. that if they don't realize I'm, that they'll realize it once they set on a wall without t-nuts then you realize what yeah. you're missing uh i'm also anti-fiberglass <laughs> like, i hate it it's why like, it's such it's such an old technology. It's such a toxic material. Um, it chips and breaks all the time. The texture is horrendous. Uh, need I go on? Uh, go for it, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, uh, I mean, you, you see these World Cups where they have all the volumes and the climber's hands are just bleeding and bleeding. Like, I, I don't think they should even use them in, in these competitions. Um, the problem is, is like, you know, it's like this, the climbing hold texture, you know, the original texture of the foam, that, that texture goes in. So it's not like a sand where a sand goes out. And a sand goes out, it just rips your skin off. Um, so, yeah, the, the normal hold texture is, like, way better um, to grab or for your skin and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. It's totally fun. I love climbing on them. Don't get me wrong, but, like, I, I talked to some guys on the internet like randomly and they're like, Oh yeah, we're thinking about going like all fiberglass. And I'm just like, why? Like, like we've been doing fiberglass for so long and it's just like so bad. And it's just like, I don't know. Well, like I don't know. <laughs> you've, your shapes have benefited so much from, from like hold shape or like a uh, manufacturing technology getting better. Like there's a bunch of stuff you've shaped that you never could have shaped 15 years ago. If like, uh, polyurethane hadn't been as strong or if you were yeah, still using sure. PU, like some of your tapers would have been sure. impossible. And some of the shapes you have in fiberglass would just be the heaviest like pieces of shit yeah, ever sure. if you didn't. So like you, you've been, you've benefited from, from fiberglass at some level The is it the shit? Um, yeah, thrive, is it the thrive guys that have been doing like, yeah, cause that's, yeah, that's one compromise. Yeah, those guys are doing it, but they're, you know, it's a, a fiberglass skin, but they're doing the, I think, polyurethane uh, on the outside. And that's, that seems good. It seems like it could still be a little perfected, but um, it I'm seems, like all for that. It seems the opposite, where the texture isn't as aggressive, but it also glosses no, out super fast. Like, they just yeah, become Yeah, it seems this... like flicker mm -hmm. than a normal hold for some reason. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just, the, the whole skin thing, it's like seeing climbers, comp climbers with just like no skin on their hands. It's like disturbing. Hmm. I don't disagree with that part. That's definitely true. Um, yeah. All right. Let's talk about walls. Um, so how, how did it come about that a huge gym chain decided to trust you with designing a massive new gym for them when you had not that much or no experience designing a commercial climbing wall? Um, well, I think, I mean, I've always been involved with earth treks and, you know, they know I'm, a, you know, a creative guy and I was kind of involved on a lower level in some of their other gyms, like the Timonian gym. I helped build with a friend. We designed that with, uh, like foam board, you know, by hand. Hmm. Um, so the design was done by 
a hand, you know, a size down model out of foam boards. And that was the first one. And then uh, they did the Rockville gym um, with Eldo Walls and the designer Jason Thomas there. And uh, I was sitting in on the meeting while he was, you know, working on the computer because um, I was in Boulder at the time and uh, I was just kind of giving feedback, um, stuff like that. And then, yeah, eventually the owner and uh, Chris Warner and uh, Scott Heitman uh, kind of had me over for dinner one night, like kind of super randomly because I'd been just traveling on the road, you know, like not really being around too much just climbing um and they're like oh we want you to design the gym uh so you need to like start learning this program <laughs> you know uh so which i didn't know anything about um although I, I do a lot of computer work um so i'm i'm familiar you know with my way around the computer so it was kind of just interesting uh process just learning the program and you know looking back on the golden uh, colorado gym um I, I would have done it way differently no, knowing now, you know, and, uh, and it was definitely a learning experience. Um, and I think by time I did the next gym, which was the Crystal City Earth Trek, uh, I had the program totally figured out um, and was able to just go in there and play around. Um, but yeah, the, the, first, the first meeting we had, it had been like a month since that initial 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 dinner and they were like okay what, do you, what have you got we want to see what you've been working on and like i wasn't building any walls i was in the program like designing this weird little place there were like these mushrooms and like these swirl walls and like you know i just wanted to get comfortable with the program and uh it was like out there you know it was like <laughs> you look at it and you're like what is this uh, and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, no, I'm just, these are just like concepts, you know, these, these aren't walls. These are just to get like, you know, stir the pot and like get some ideas out on, on paper or whatever. But, uh, yeah, it, it was pretty funny. My, my first, I can probably get a screen grab of that, but, uh, it, it was, it was, uh, very, very strange, like little land of like all these weird walls. Yeah, man. If you if you find uh, records of that, throw it up on Instagram or something. I think people would love to. I remember hearing that you mentioned that in an interview you did a few years ago, and I thought it would be interesting to yeah. see like what what could have been if you were given like free reign and had zero experience. Um, sure. yeah, so so um, what a. Uh, the thing I'm interested in with the first gym is kind of like what constraints were put on you and also what requirements did you have from either Earth Trex or Waltopia? Because when I look back at that wall design, I see some things that that I feel I can kind of pick up, like you were forced to kind of add a feature like this or um, you, a wall may have been like a compromise. Um, so how much yeah. free reign were you given? I know you weren't working with the architect, so I'm assuming the pillars and beams were already like pre-decided for you, but what, what were yeah. your limitations? Um, yeah, the building was, you know, how it was, and we were kind of working around in that, in that space. And that's like the hardest thing, I think, when starting any gym design is getting in there and being like, okay, where are the walls going to go? Like, where's the flow? Like, how are things going to move? You know, was, is there going to be a dead end or whatever? Um, yeah, I was like, I had all these ideas and I could kind of do them, but I couldn't do them like completely. So I was definitely getting help from the Waltopia designers. Um, you know, like I would be like, oh, okay, I want this wall to have like kind of this hook sickle or whatever. And they would kind of like, I would piece it together, but, you know, it wasn't like quite right. So they would like kind of touch it up. Um, and then actually I went back into the design, like after I kind of figured everything out and realized that, you know, there are a lot of facets that could have been removed. Um, not necessarily on their end. I think they were just trying to make it happen because it was, it was kind of comp complex. Um, I know the, the, the builders were like, not, not annoyed or anything, but they were like, this is the most difficult wall we've had to put together. Right. Um, but no, I, I did go back and like redesign some things and like, let's say, you know, a, a feature that 
required, you know, 12 panels, like I could now get the same thing accomplished in like seven panels. Huh. Um, so it, it, it was hard, you know, because I had all these like big ideas that I wanted to, to get across and I wasn't like technical enough to like get them done and they weren't technical enough to like, I don't know, you know, read my mind and, you know, and put it on, onto the, the wall. But, um, I mean, there's so many other things, you know, like the walls can't be too overhanging if they're top rope. Um, you know, you need this much space behind, you know, distance. So there's like so much going into like the restraints of what you can do on the wall. Um, and that, that space for sure is definitely a, a tight space, you know, um, it's not like a big open facility with no columns or anything like that. Um, so yeah. And I don't know, you're always pushing back and forth with the people, you know, you're like, Oh, steeper or they're like not as steep. And, um, nowadays I, I, you know, I just try to have everything, you know, represented and, you know, I usually go in and do like, you know, how many square foot of this angle do we have? Like how many square foot of like deep angle do we have? And like really get like by the numbers, what you're looking at. Um, you know, and you're like, okay, we've got like 20% of the wall is like, you know, zero, 10 degrees. And then, you know, like we've got 5% of the wall. It's like 30 degrees. Maybe we need more, you know, in that range. Um, so yeah, everything now is kind of by the numbers and I really, you know, every panel I do is, is chosen and, you know, the angle of it is chosen. And I think a lot of, a lot of wall designers or a lot of wall builders are just kind of putting walls in to fill space. Like they may have a cool concept here and they may have a cool concept here, but what's happening between there was not what they chose. It was what they had to do to make it, to make it work. Um, so I think being able to like, you know, know everything that you've designed is like, you know, for a reason or for a purpose. Yeah, let's talk about that and like not having filler walls and stuff. I'm going to throw some some screen grabs from the the facility walkthrough. So these aren't live pictures of some of the gyms you've done. They're just from those like Waltopia renders or maybe renders that you did yourself. Um, so your gyms have uh, a lot of character in every area and each section has like a really defined identity based on the, just the geometry of the wall that you've built. Um, is that something that that's important to like the customer experience? Because I know from from my angle, I think it's fascinating, and it's uh, I I've been really curious if people still refer to certain areas by the names that you gave them when you uh, created them. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about like like this shape at uh, at the yeah uh, at the Golden Gym, having the blade in the black on the left, yeah, and that, that wave the wall. Blade. Yeah, these these kind of identities, like are these things that uh, are still uh, talked about in the facility by climbers and by root setters? Like, do people know these areas by yeah. the names that you gave them? For sure, for sure. The the blade and then like the ship's prow there. Um, yeah, I think those are important. And I think, you know, yeah, having a wall that you walk up to it and you're, you're like, okay, that's like the octagon or whatever. Like, it has a name because, you know, it's stunning and you want to be on it. Um, and I feel like it's the same thing I look for when I'm looking for first ascent outside, you know, like I want to be on the arete of this big boulder, you know, I want to be under the belly of, of this, you know, and if the way the walls are all this random, sure, you're having a fun time and it's a cool experience, but like, I don't know, I like the first time I went climbing, it was like on this vertical face and I'm standing there and there's this big roof up to the right. And like, I'm just like, you know, what's that? Like, because it was a stunning feature, you know, I think that's important. And um, yeah, people come in and like, oh, I want to get up there, you know, like I, I want to be up there. I want to be on that. Um, so yeah, I think that's really important um, visual, visually and having things feel separate from each other and it's almost like there's little boulders here and there or, you know, little features here and there. The the Golden Gym was kind of the only gym you've done that I've seen so far that used a lot of these three-dimensional, what I assume are fiberglass shapes that yeah. Waltopia would have built. Yeah. Um, I'm really yeah. curious, was that something that was kind of pushed on you guys by Waltopia or were, were was Earthtrex or yourself excited about those? Because in all the designs you've done since, you haven't brought them back. So yeah. that, that sounds like a, it, like feedback to me. 
Same. Go back to my uh, previous comments on fiberglass. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, it's it's not it's not good. It's uh it's more expensive. Uh, it doesn't wear as well. Um, ropes eat through fiberglass. Um, and the back of a climbing hold is flat, you know, uh, climbing holds aren't round. And, uh, I don't know. They, they wanted some fiberglass features. Yeah. That was the deal. They were like, Oh, we want fiberglass features. And, um, we ended up doing this, the blades of fiberglass feature and the top of boulders of fiberglass feature. That wave is also a fiberglass feature to the right of the blade there. Um, so yeah, that was something they wanted to do. And then after that, I was like, okay, we can create these exact same features using flat panels. Um, and just better, better all around for everything. You know, you can put volumes on, you can do everything and it's, and it's cheaper than doing fiberglass. Uh, there are some patterns that unlike the blade or the, the death star have you've iterated on in all of the earth treks gyms that I've seen at least. So the two that, that, that kind of resonate with me that I really love looking at are the kind of like hurricane or cyclone shapes. Um, this, these are, this is yeah. an arch, arch actually these like kind of just big waving, I guess it was originally the scythe. Um, and then a similar uh, thing that you did would have been the heart walls um, on the right side here. Yeah. And you've done this in, in pretty much every gym uh, that you've designed for earth treks. What makes these walls timeless? Like what is it that these particular patterns have achieved that make them so desirable to repeat that some of your other patterns haven't? Um, I, I think that was more, you know, along the lines of what they wanted to. And, you know, a lot of people look at my designs and they're like, oh, you know, this is, you know, your, your idea. But I think people have to remember too, like, this is what Earth Trek at the time wanted. Um, and I mean, basically, you know, the palette's endless as far as what we can do. And so like, yeah, these three crystal formations on, on the left there, that was something that stood out and they were like, okay, we can use those in a couple other gyms. Uh, the heart was cool because, you know, one side, you know, went in and one, one side went out, you know, so sometimes the outside in real rock, you see how like a huge part of the wall, like cleaves off. And that was kind of the concept behind that, you know, like at some point these were stuck together and they like broke apart. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, more or less they kind of wanted to repeat things in some of the gyms just to kind of give people a familiar feel if they were traveling and going to, going to different gyms. Um, a lot of your shapes, the heart being one of them involves a lot of, uh, slab angles and, I, the wisdom that I at least understand, although I've never done any wall design, is that like when you start putting slab on rope walls, you get these rest positions. It really changes how like it kind of limits what you can set on these certain walls. Is is that something mm -hmm. that that uh, that is is true in your opinion? Because with the hexes that you've designed, you create a lot of these like protrusions that give you basically a ledge on the top of them or in the bottom of them. And it really mm -hmm. changes the experience, but it seems like you keep coming back to some of these things. So I kind of assume they're popular. Yeah. I mean, stuff like this is, yeah, it's like it is, but it's definitely intended for more intermediate terrain. Um, you know, having these pods that you're kind of climbing in and out of, you know, like Red River Gorge, you know, esque where you like climb in a Waco and you like climb out of a Waco. Um, I think to some extent, but I, I don't know, like setting in golden and stuff like that. Like I never really got tired of those. Um, you know, you can always set like a different type of mantle or, or something like that. And like the ones on the right, you know, we are trying to like, you know, have that upper part of the, the facet, you know, not be that slabby. So some of those, you know, they're not as slabby as they look in, as, as far as like this rendering. But yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. And I think, um, you know, we had so much space to work with. Like if you had a small gym and you're like, okay, you know, this is like a 10,000 square foot gym. We need to like use every part of the wall, you know, to our advantage. At the Earth Trek, it wasn't that that wasn't the case. It was like, okay, we have space to experiment here. Um, you know, we can use this and it won't like ruin the wall or ruin the gym. It's, you know, like there's plenty of other wall 
Who has the facility that like we can do other stuff on? Um, of the of the patterns, I, I, do you have a term that you use to kind of refer to these sections? Uh, that you, I've been saying the word patterns to refer to like a, a heart wall or like a, a blocks wall or something. But how do you refer to, mm -hmm. to those sections? Um, yeah, like the hexes, you know, the protruding hexes. Um, yes, I mean, similar heart wall. Like that's that's the cool thing is like you know you see it and right away you like understand like why it's called the heart wall it's not like oh this is our you know whatever jungle wall and you're like okay they called it the jungle wall because <laughs> that sounds interesting or something yeah um well when you're when you're setting on these like i i don't know how much you get to set on the walls that you've built but i'm, I'm guessing you've set on a lot of them maybe at least once or something but are there any yeah. are, are there any of these patterns that you've have been like really pleasantly surprised or maybe the opposite about how they set and how they climb once you've uh, once you've built them though the one i was really curious about is this block feature where you have these like cascading kind mm. of pillars coming yeah. down which is isn't one of the most like visually striking compared to like this spiral on the right side or something mm -hmm. but climbing wise it it kind of um I, I don't like the idea of climbing through successive like 90 degree roofs, but this was a, a cool yeah. iteration where it's not that. And it, it kind of had a more natural flow while having a very strong visual effect. Yeah. I, I, it's like, I took a lot of those shapes and kind of flattened them. Mm -hmm. So like it has a really visual 3d feel to it, but you know, like those angle changes were like between like, you know, one and five degrees. Um, so it, it has this really nice 3D look, but you're actually not, you know, you know, being upside down and vertical. And, and um, it's kind of like you're almost drawing with the walls. You know, you, you create these things that almost origami-ish, you know, where you fold paper and it has this, you know, shadowy look to it, but it, it's not like an actual, like, object. Um, I didn't actually get to settle on that wall. That wall... I, I like that wall, and I did another wall like that in, in Inglewood. Um, but the wall to the right, that spiral, is kind of a perfected version of the original golden uh, kind of hurricane wall they had. Mm -hmm. um, and that wall also is, like, very, very subtle. Um, I think that, like, blue panel is, like, maybe a little flabby, like, you know, negative five or less. I think the top white panel is probably a little overhanging like five degrees and, you know, the center area is probably like vertical. So there's really not that, you know, much of a change. Um, they did have an awesome route going through that broken area where it jumped across from one side to the other. Uh, that and that was, in that kind yeah, of like chimney or whatever. Yeah, there's like the, the spiral's broken and then you have this chimney that has these hex patterns in it. Um, that's like not, you know, big enough to like reach across, but, you know, they put volumes and you're able to like jump from one side to the other. Um, and that that whole area was originally, the concept was that there was going to be a window back there. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and that's kind of why I, I originally did that. I was like, okay, I have the spiral pattern, it's broken you know, you see through it and then you have climbers climbing on, you know, the arrests facing each other and you see through it, you know, the window from outside or whatever. Um, I guess the window that got put away at some point, you know, they decided against it. And then we just ended up doing like a little corner back in there. Aside from creating these patterns for particular spaces, do you, uh, from your own experience, do you give thought to what an area of a wall might be used for? Um, not just in whether this is going to be a predominantly hard wall or like easy wall, but do you have guidance on like, Hey, we want a teaching wall here. How are you going to execute something for that? Or like, these are really basic examples, like a, a kid's wall or a yeah. teaching wall or whatever, but what, what yeah, treatments sure. do you apply for those kind of uses? Um, I mean, definitely, you know, you have like the, the main lead area, which is, you know, you have to have, you know, and then the kids area, um, definitely like with something like the kids area, you want it to be teachable, you know, so you want them to have corners, you want them to have roofs, you want them to have like den options or, or mantling options. Um, so yeah, it, it really depends on, you know, you know, what, 
the owner is you know, I've done a bunch of gyms now for other people and you know it really depends on you know what the clientele is or you know what they're trying to you know get for the climbers I mean I'm always a big believer that you know you build the gym that you want the climbers to be you don't build a gym for the clientele you know like you build a gym for the clientele they're going to be bored of it in like two years and then no one's going to progress but you build you know a gym that's going to push them and a gym that's going to make them stronger in five years you know the average is going to go up from v5 to v8 you know it's like you know it's, it's pretty cool how you can do that by you know the, making the facility you know a certain way does does that uh concept of building the gym for who you want them to be rather than who your clientele is uh, do you, do you feel like gym owners can accept that kind of concept as easily as you do? No, I, I think it's very scary, you know, because they're like, oh, well, we don't want to turn people off or you know have it be too hard. Um, so yeah, it's it's, it's scary, um, and you know, it's like a lasting thing. You know, it's like you you build something and you're like, okay, <laughs> uh, maybe we shouldn't have done that crack there or whatever. You know, it's like the same thing forever. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's hard. Um, it it really depends on the client, and it's awesome when the client gives me more, uh, you know, choice. Um, it's like I don't know. I, I've got enough experience, and hopefully they'll trust me. But yeah, it's like I see big differences in gyms where people really trust me, and they're like, okay, you know, do do whatever you think. Versus, oh no, we're not sure. We're kind of afraid, you know. Um, it's hard to like talk people in this back kind of stuff. I don't know what things are like uh, where you are right now when you go to like your local gym. Um, for us, we just reopened uh, our facility with like strict measures about social distancing and it completely changes how you look at your facility that, you know, in our case, yeah. the, the gym turned 30 years old uh, a couple weeks ago and it's the same building, but it's like, it's not the same vibe at all. And, and everything yeah. is so restricted. Um, how have you given any thought to like how the designs you've created might change if you had to design a gym for this kind of reality where everybody has to be six feet apart and you want yeah. a sense of openness and cleanliness, like in, in general, gyms have been moving towards this kind of open feeling, um, and and obviously everybody tries to be clean. There, there's no dungeons anymore. Um, but you know, in some of the some of the areas you've designed, you still have boulder walls that are fairly close to each other, and there's only so much space in between to to sit and to mm -hmm. walk. Like, is it really just about putting more space between walls and just having giant open spaces? I'm curious if you've. I mean, any thought yeah. To this. I I guess so. I mean, preferably, you know, it's always great when you don't have two walls facing each other. And then you end up having climbers that are back to back, you know, um, bouldering or, or route climbing. So yeah, maybe you'll see less of that. Um, I hate being in those, you know, closed in situations and you're like waiting to get on a route or, you know, you're waiting to see who's, who's going to like get off the wall so you can get on the wall. Um, but as far as the actual design goes, I feel like we've kind of been doing the right thing as you know, there are some areas that, you know, you're saying are a little close, but in general, like preferably a section of wall, which would be one style of wall would be 12 feet wide, you know, preferably um, six to 12 feet, something like that, you know, is what you usually get. But uh, like in a perfect world, like it'd be great if every feature, you know, was separated in like these 12 foot sections. That's kind of like what I shoot for when, you know, I'm doing like a you know, different style, like an arete here or whatever, like try to have zones, try to have, you know, each wall be its own space. And it seems like now they are, they're taping those sections off, you know, um, having one climber in each section. So that seems like it's kind of on point, but yeah, I would just say, you know, the openness of, you know, not having people around you or behind you. Um, yeah. Gyms like that, that, you know, it's just, one wall in front of you and everything else behind you is empty. That's like kind of preferable. After but, uh, no, it's, it's weird. Like it's, it's a weird world out there. Like, and I hated going to the gym before. Like, <laughs> I don't like, I don't like going to gyms. 
uh, I spent, you know, so many years working in gyms and just that feeling of being in a gym. Like, I mean, I was 24 hours, 24 seven in a gym all the time. I would sleep at the gym, you know, uh, sleep behind the wall, um, back in the day. But, uh, yeah, I kind of try to avoid gyms and had my home wall. So, I don't know. We've just been hanging out, laying low. Um, the gym is open here in El Paso. Uh, it's a very small gym, super small gym. And, you know, they're, you know, doing reservations and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens, you know, like with everything and, you know, gyms surviving. Can gyms survive with this amount of, you know, clients? And, you know, can this work how it is, you know? Will we make it out of this before it, you know, stops working? Um, it's crazy. Yeah, man. Um, in the last couple of months, like hundreds, if not thousands of home walls have gone up and you've got all these amateurs yeah. building walls for the first time, buying holds for the first time. Uh, what advice do you have for people designing a wall in there? Like it's going to be small, you know, it's going to be probably shittily yeah. built. What advice do you have for people designing a wall that's going to be great for them and for buying holds that's going to be great um, for them? I think that's the major thing is budgeting your hold, like having a budget for holds. Like people are like, oh yeah, it's only going to cost me a couple hundred dollars to build a wall. Like that's not the wall. Like that's one part of the wall. And, and then they, you know, they get all these discounted holds they're like oh i got this 10 pack from this company and i got this from this company and they're just kind of piecing it together like i mean plan on spending money on the holds like the holds are what make the wall and uh i think i don't know like i came i always grew up with a home wall like i had a home wall like back in 1993 92 or 93 was probably my first home wall and you know you just want to cover it with holds um, I don't understand what people are doing, setting routes at their home wall. Like, like don't set routes. <laughs> like, uh, it's not a commercial gym. Like you don't need a circuit or something like put as many holes on the wall as possible, uh, create new problems all the time. Um, you know, like you'll understand movement more. You'll understand how movement works. You'll understand like how things, you know, work setting, um, yeah, just, it's, I don't know, it's, it's hard. I, I had definitely some, like, kind of ghetto walls, too, you know, like, my first wall was, the room was six feet high, um, <laughs> because the, the room above it was a sunken living room, so the basement room was only six foot tall, and I had this, you know, slightly overhanging wall that was, like, probably 10 degrees overhanging, and so I could just get on the wall put my feet on the wall and move my hands around. Right. <laughs> like I wasn't even really moving my feet, but I was like, Oh, if I just keep moving my hands, you know, eventually I'll get pumped. Um, and then I ended up covering the whole wall or the whole ceiling with, uh, you know, panels. And eventually it was like, I just climbed on the ceiling all the time. Hmm. That, that was actually where I got really interested in roof climbing. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I was, I didn't have that many holds. I was, you know, buying holds back then, like Nicros, Stone Age had just started. I got some samples from them. Uh, Pusher, I had ordered some from Pusher from an ad I saw in a magazine. Uh, but I was making a lot of my own holds. Um, I was drilling out like river rocks, these cobbles. I found it's this place in Seneca, West Virginia. I found these awesome cobbles and I had them drilled out of my roof. I made all these roof crimps out of two by fours. Um, just like, yeah, it's like anything, you know, it's, you don't have to, you don't have to spend tons of money. Like there are other ways to do it as far as, you know, like making holds or, or using other things for holds. But I think you just want as many options as possible. And, you know, I think you'll be more psyched to train if it's more endless than, you know, you go in and you climb your four tape routes you set every time. Like what, what is that? It's been really right. rough seeing how much money gets spent on like home walls with like a 90 degree inside corner and then like covered in flat holds. Oh. And you're just like, oh shit, this is gonna, I feel really bad because I, there's no advice on like how to, like, you know, people talk about how to build a home wall or whatever, but everybody building them these days is a creature of like the modern gym, right? So they're climbing yeah. to them 
isn't about backfill. It's about like climbing fucking five star amazing lines with like European yeah. super holds and shit. And you're like running out of a corner to somewhere else. And then you realize, oh, that only works on a very specific scale. And so then you see people yeah. drop like five or six grand, if not more. And it's not actually that fun. So I feel, I feel really bad for some yeah. of the people that have done it, but um, yeah, it's a, it's the kind of thing where I wish we had people speaking out about like, you know, how to do this properly because some things just aren't going to work. So yeah, for sure. Um, I'm, I'm planning on it. I've, I've been like pimping out my wall forever and it's never going to be done. Uh, but I'd like to do like a YouTube video where I just talk about, you know, like how the wall works, how it's laid out. Like I'm constantly like, like I have a lot of big holds on my wall, which most people don't have. Most people are afraid to buy big, big holds for mm -hmm. the wall. But I also, I, I tweak those out. I put T-nuts in a bunch of holds. Like I just drill holds out, put T-nuts in, or I screw holds on. Like I'm definitely, you know, taking the most advantage of the space as possible. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to do a video like that. Um, just some simple things like that. And, uh, I think another thing it reminded me when you were asking about texture, you know, people are always talking about texture, like, Oh, our, our company has the best texture. Our company has really good texture. Um, and texture is something that like is constantly changing. And when you design a hold and it gets molded and that first pour comes out, that's the original texture. Um, and then the problem you see is a lot of these companies like, these Aragons or whatever, that big production house, they're producing so many holds and holds aren't getting remolded and the texture is getting worse and worse and worse. Um, sometimes they're even even not remolding uh, the original, they're remolding an older hold just because what, for whatever reason they didn't. Um, so you'll see texture get really bad over time or, or you'll go in gyms and you're like, wow, why is this hold so aggressive? You know, like, and it has nothing to do with the original shape or anything like that. It's like kind of a production issue. Um, but back to my point, home walls, I sand all my holds down. Like everything that's not a sloper that I'm like, you know, can't hold on to, I take a piece of sandpaper and I sand it down. Like you can basically, you know, perfect the texture on your home wall, like as much as you want. Like people are always complain, oh, I got these new holds. They just burn my skin so much. I can't train. I train for like 40 minutes. I can't train. Like it's just killing me. Like sand it down. Like especially jugs. Like jugs don't need to have texture. Like <laughs> jugs can be smooth as wood, you know? Uh, so that's like a huge, that's like my secret tip. I, I, ran, I ran into so much resistance sanding holds and, and admittedly I was doing these these at a gym but we had like we did a youth comp where we got like a those like brand new Technic villains it was probably our second set and mm. there was a dyno where you just were launching like nine year olds like five feet to the left and they would just sink into one of these giant relatively sharp <laughs> jugs like the radiuses on those aren't aren't that big. Um, but like we were forerunning it for five minutes and basically bleeding and we still had like half the round to do. So later that day, I like sanded it down just because like, why, why not? And I, I think that's honestly something not just for home walls, but gyms too. Like yeah. your texture is going to go away already. Why cause the first like six months of your climbers to just bleed through a session? So yeah, I completely agree. Especially like you'll still get holds from places like Technic and eGrips where they're, they're on that older, more coarse texture foam. And through that process of remolding, like you mentioned, like you get really, really mm -hmm. coarse pores and it's, it's yeah. Freaking aggro, man. So yeah, I completely yeah, so agree. I'm really, really glad you brought that up. <laughs> um, nice. You know, it's awesome. Like it'll extend your home wall sessions like so much. Like, um, Yeah. Speaking of uh, of filming a video for about um about uh, uh, like doing a home wall, I started filming a series uh, where I ask roots like but for gyms that had like a backfill wall, like a project wall. I would mm -hmm. film the wall and talk to the root setters for like fifteen to twenty minutes about like the theory behind their spray uh -huh. wall, and it was super boring. So I've never shared any of them, and I'm probably never going to make any more. But really briefly, uh -huh. because we're giving people advice on doing a home wall. Um, if you were to start a fresh spray wall, do you have like a, a, a system you use for setting it and making sure that it, that it works? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so 
Yeah, volumes first, you know, any kind of volumes you have, wooden volumes, whatever, volumes going first, and then you just go down from size. Like, you start with the biggest holds, and you just go down from size. Um, biggest holds, you try to have those all spaced out, and then you just start filling in, and then when you can't fill in, like, with the peanuts, then you start screwing stuff in. Um, and I think it's important, I most probably most important is, you know, in each section is to have a different style of hold, you know? So like hmm. there's a pinch, there's a Gaston, there's a jug, there's an underclean, you know, there's a sloper. Um, and that, that takes some time too, you know, like you, you may put the spray wall up and you, you may take a couple of sessions climbing on it where you're like, okay, this is good, but I feel like I'm kind of lacking jugs in this section, you know, like warming up, I'm having trouble getting through this section or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think just, you know, starting big and going smaller and, you know, trying to make sure everything is represented. Um, like to have a lot of foot options. Uh, I don't like kickboards either. So no kickboards. I would, I would recommend no kickboards. Um, I, I don't like climbing on a wall with a kickboard where you're on the kickboard for like the first three moves and you're just like, you just like are laying down there with your feet on the kickboard the entire time um like the like pull on the wall and you're on the angle you know you're not your feet aren't just down there hanging out um so i, I would recommend no kickboard um yeah i don't know yeah don't be afraid to screw things on don't be afraid to add things to holds um you know holds are easily fixed too like if you have you know a hole in, in it you can patch it like there's like so much you can do um with the home wall all right. We're going long, so I'm only going to ask a few more questions and we're going to kind of sure. touch touch a few last topics. And so one of them is because you're, you're like very few people get to set climbs on walls that they have designed themselves and even fewer people get to set climbs on walls they've designed with holds that they designed also. So you are one of if like a very small crew of people with the ultimate multifaceted experience of creating indoor rock climbs. Um, when you teach people, what lessons do you have that, that you find that other people don't have? Like what, what have you gained from all these experiences? Um, and if that's too hard, I guess the question is just like, what themes do you find important for you to teach to uh, young root setters? Uh, well, yeah, it's interesting because I didn't, you know, go through the whole like root setting criteria. Like I kind of, it was mentors, you know, back in the day, like, I was I was taught route setting from uh, this Spanish climber Jory Salas, who was an awesome climber back in the day, and he taught me to set. And, and uh, so I'm sure a lot of things that I learned aren't really used today or not used that much. But um, I would have to say, and I think this is true in a lot of things I do or try to do, is you know start on the funnest area like you don't necessarily always have to start at the beginning. Okay, here are my start, here are my footholds. Like, if you want to use this really cool big hold, start there, you know? Like, uh, whenever I'm working on any kind of project, it's, it's easiest to tackle the funnest area because of the most interesting, I mean, it doesn't have to be funnest or whatever, but like the most interesting, stimulating uh, area, it's like that is what you can do right away because you're, you're interested, you're excited, um, you have concepts, you have the ideas, and you start there, and then you can kind of spread out from there, and you know you can you know, set down from there or set up from there. Um, I found that's always really helpful instead of being like, oh, I have to start here and do I have to figure out how I'm going to get to this hold, and this is going to be the cool hold, and I want to revolve the whole problem around that. Like a lot of times, I'll start at that hold um, just because it's, it's easier, and then you start filling in the pieces, and then the beginning gets more interesting because now you already understand the rest, you know, like you can go back and be like, okay, like this makes sense now. Like, how do I get there kind of thing? Um, I, I like trying moves personally, um, just to feel things out. And I know a lot of setters don't nowadays. And I know it's, I mean, it's also, you know, you know, you're trying to get a lot of problems up, you know, you're trying to get five problems up a day or whatever, if you're sitting in the commercial gym, um so i think they just want to get holes on the wall and then full run later but i was originally taught you know to, to try moves feel things out so i kind of i like that 
I mean, I do set the other style where I just put the holds on for sure. But um, I don't know. I, I like that. It's like you're more immersed in it and you understand it a little better. And a lot of times there's, you know, very little flow running to do afterwards. Um, I think it just depends on the style of setting you're doing. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, and then uh, last question is um, – I get very nostalgic for like an era of competition that I was never involved in whenever I watch bring, mm -hmm. bring the ruckus, um, uh -huh. from dosage. Um, I've, I've done the youth coaching stuff and I volunteer a lot with the local comp scene. I really enjoy competitions and I, I love, I love, you know, I don't, I don't even care that much about the climbing anymore. I just really like putting on these events and people having a good time and trying to make competition climbing mm -hmm. something that's like lucrative for, for great climbers. And it, I love seeing the, the personalities in that film, including yourself and, and your circle of friends. And I find that I don't know where that's gone. Um, like climbing has, has changed a lot. Like it's the competition scene is yeah. now dominated by kids predominantly. That's where most of yeah. the, the, the comps are. Um, is there hope for seeing people that have the kind of expression and character and personality that you guys, you know, portrayed in that film is, can that ever come back? Like that's, uh, it's so compelling. Yeah. I see it sometimes, you know, I, I see, you know, a couple guys out there doing something interesting, but I think it's hard. Yeah. Kids are getting younger and younger. And at that age, you know, you're not as, you know, you know, out there, you're not trying to like prove anything as much. You just are climbing. It's fun. You know, it's what you do. And I think back then it's like, we were all like, you know, trying to make a name for ourselves and like really wanted to like be our own person, our own style of climber. So it was like, you kind of had this persona, you, you know, everyone was like something different, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and there was so, you know, it wasn't that many people in climbing and now it's like overwhelming. Um, Climbing is definitely a different sport than when I found it. And uh, I don't know, I, I try. I got into climbing to kind of get away from normal society, you know? Like, I, I didn't like what I saw going on in the world, and I still don't like what I see going on in the world. And I didn't want to be a part of it. I wanted to live in a van and, you know, travel and climb and not have any part of it because it's whack, like it's whack out there. <laughs> like, and, uh, I think, you know, back in the day you would see the same people. And if you met a climber, you would always, you know, know that there was this like kind of unwritten code as everyone respected everyone. And like, you know, if someone left their gear somewhere, people weren't going to take it, you know, everything, everyone was like, really like, you felt like a part of this tribe that was like very close knit and everyone was like really like, honest and respect to each other and i feel like it's gotten so big that we've gotten away from that and people are just i mean so many people have access to climbing and you know it's like these you know it's become so popular and there's like so many people commenting on things and people are attacking everyone and it's like wow these aren't the people that i thought were climbers you know it's like yeah. this isn't what climbing what climbing is um so it's crazy, like what what's happened. But um, the cool thing about climbing is it's what you make it, you know. So climbing for me is going out and finding first ascent and being alone and you know being outside and not caring about all that stuff. And that still exists, and you know you can still find that out there. Well, I'm I'm holding on hope that you're gonna like develop some secret fuck you youth team of climbers in El Paso that just like <laughs> bring back the the uh, the fire right. to uh, to everything right. and make it interesting again. So if you ever if you're ever interested and you need yeah. you need some donations, I'll I'll chip in twenty bucks or whatever to to, sure. to, to make that thing go. Um, but anyway, I really for appreciate sure. your time, Jason Keel, for uh, for for chatting. Um, just before we go, thanks as always to the patrons, especially to the G5 for, uh, for supporting us. If you want to get Plastic Weekly stickers uh, or ask a question of one of our guests, uh, send us a, a few dollars and, and you can support the podcast. And of course, make sure you uh, like and subscribe. Follow me on Instagram, follow Jason on Instagram, and maybe he'll post some some pictures of his like mushroom dreamscape of a climbing gym of the uh, first draft of, uh, 
of um of the golden gym but uh but otherwise uh make sure you stay tuned for further episodes jason thanks again for your time and uh and we'll see you in the next episode